In the last video, we talked about the global trends in urbanization, but we didn't talk at all about the benefits and drawbacks that come from an increasingly urban population. In this video, we'll focus on the challenges that urbanization creates across a number of topic areas, but also on the opportunities that it provides. In a way, this video is a snapshot of the rest of the course, because urbanization affects all of the systems that we as humans depend on. Specifically, in this video, we'll look at how urbanization affects energy availability and use. We'll take a short look at how food systems tend to change as populations become more urban, and this will set the stage for a much more detailed discussion of agriculture later. As we all know, urban settings can have a major effect on health and disease, so we'll explore those a little bit, and lastly, we'll finish with a discussion of how urbanization affects water safety and availability. Let's start with the discussion of energy systems. And when I say energy system, what I mean is a combination of fuel supply type, energy distribution infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, and the many other factors that influence how we get and use energy. These systems, for obvious reasons, are expensive to build. The photo here shows something that's actually fairly rare, power lines in a rural part of Eastern Africa, in this case, Tanzania. In rural sub-Saharan Africa, about 600 million people do not have access to electricity. And it's worth thinking about that for a minute before we talk about cities. No electricity means no refrigeration, and that means a higher risk of foodborne disease. No electricity means no light at night to study or do homework, and no ability to charge a cell phone, let alone a bigger piece of electronics. In these settings in sub-Saharan Africa, transportation is also very limited. Public buses are rare, and in many cases, ownership of motorcycles and cars is very limited or just non-existent in places. If you think about why people choose to move to a city, energy has to be at the top of the list because electricity and transportation are basic infrastructure needs for all human populations, but they can be very difficult to provide in rural areas and low-income countries. In a sense, then, urbanization is a potential solution to the problem of limited access to energy, at least for these locations. Looking at this a little more closely, we see a world of energy haves and have-nots. The area in white on this map are countries where there is near universal access to electricity. In these settings, it doesn't make a difference whether you're in a rural or an urban setting. Chances are you'll have access to power. It's a different story in, de in developing economies because in these locations, including most of the low-income low countries and some of the middle-income countries, electricity distribution infrastructure is more limited than it is in high-income settings. When we talk about energy later in more detail, we'll talk a lot about centralized versus decentralized electricity generation. But for now, the key difference to be aware of is that centralized facilities are things like power plants. Power plants use fuels like coal, natural gas, or nuclear to generate electricity that is carried along high voltage power lines to the point where it's eventually used. There are renewable sources of energy that can also be used in this way, as we'll talk about in the energy section. But the key point to understand here is that most of the high income countries have developed their energy systems around centralized electricity distribution. So basically, there are power lines wherever you need them and wherever people live. This is not the case elsewhere in the world, and in many development economies, there is limited or even non-existent electric distribution capacity outside of urban areas. And so part of the draw of urban settings in these countries is the ability to access electricity and all the benefits that it provides. So if we were to break down the urbanization challenges and opportunities, we would say that in high income settings, the issue in urban settings, and also the opportunity, is to create more access to renewable energy via centralized electricity distribution systems. This is also true in low and middle income settings, but we also have to consider issues of energy access and energy equity, which vary a lot from rural to urban settings and vary a lot within urban locations. Transportation is probably a little less important than electricity in a basic human sense but it's hard for any of us living in developed economies to imagine a world without transportation options. Cities or urban settings require transportation because of the nature of work and life in an urban setting. And that means that you have to move around. And so the key choice that cities, states, or countries have to make about transportation in urban settings is between public and private options. 
And there, so if you look around the world, there are massive differences in the way that cars are used. You can see car ownership statistics from 2014 underneath the images. And even amongst the highly developed economies of the US, Germany, and South Korea, there's a massive difference in the number of cars that are owned by individuals. These statistics are a little bit hard to come by, but I can guarantee that the number of 83 cars per thousand in China is now considerably higher as more and more people buy personal cars. The decision to develop public transportation in a specific way changes the nature of urban settings. The photo of the train here is from Vienna, Austria, where there's an exceptional public transportation system, and a resident can very easily live without a car. These are choices that were made during the development of the city that now change the nature of life in that particular setting. The U.S. has tended to focus far more than Europe on personal car transport, and part of that is due to the extensive nature of suburban development in the U.S. Suburbs are the lower density housing settings that ring cities, and they tend to increase transportation impacts as well as the average environmental footprint of residents in these settings. You wouldn't necessarily think that food systems would change with urbanization, but in fact, food and urbanization are deeply linked. So let's pull that apart a little bit. Food access, especially in low-income settings, varies considerably from rural to urban. And in general, food access is higher in urban areas than it is in rural areas. When you read or watch information about a large famine somewhere in the world, it's most likely in a rural setting where food supplier distribution has been disrupted. In urban areas, there tends to be a more consistent food supply, and when food insecurity occurs, it tends to be related more to economic access issues than to supply issues. The other interesting issue with urban settings is that of obesity. Obesity is increasing even in low and middle income countries and is increasing most quickly in urban settings. In high income countries, it's a huge issue everywhere. Interestingly, though, in the United States, obesity tends to be higher in rural settings than in urban settings for reasons that are not fully understood. There's a link to a CDC, Center for Disease Control, research study on the page if you want to look into this some more. And if you find yourself someday in one of the world's megacities, you can be pretty confident that you're going to find a combination of food-related problems that range from undernutrition, not enough calories, or nutrient deficiency, to obesity in the space of a few tens of kilometers. The other key thing to understand about urbanization and food is that it changes the way that we actually access food. A supply chain is the set of steps from production to processing to transport that are involved in taking a good, in this case food, from raw materials to its eventual consumption or use. For food, that would mean a farm, transport to a processing facility, transport to sales and distribution points, and finally consumption. Urbanization tends to increase the length and the complexity of food supply chains because people in urban areas tend to increase their consumption of more processed foods and just for the simple reason that cities are hard places to grow large amounts of crops, so that food has to be transported in. So the global trend in urbanization interacts with and likely accelerates another global trend toward the centralization of food production. That centralization and industrialization includes a trend toward larger farms, more industrialized supply chains, increased processing and food production, and increased transport time and distance. We'll look at those types of changes in more detail when we talk about agriculture, but the key point here is that in this particular case, urbanization tends to accelerate this other associated change in agriculture. I think at this particular point in time, Everyone knows that urban centers change the way that disease moves through populations. As we've seen with COVID-19, the high density, population density of urban settings creates unique challenges to the prevention of disease and disease spread. However, these settings also have the possibility of improving mitigation measures to reduce disease transmission, and they typically have better treatment facilities in rural areas. So for example, really common and serious diseases like malaria or cholera can actually be reduced in urbanization or in urban settings because of mitigation measures that are more easily deployed in those places. The other place where urbanization can change disease or health outcomes is in comparison to low-income rural settings around the world. In some of these locations, childhood malnutrition is a major issue, and basic health care, including and maybe specifically maternal care, can be very limited or non-existent. <laughs> 
So in these cases, urbanization at least offers the opportunity to address these issues. But as with all of these topics, food, water, energy, everything, the reality of what happens in a city depends on the policy decisions and the resources used to address specific problems. The last topic I want to talk about is water. Access to clean and reliable water supply is one of the key benefits of urban settings in low and middle income countries. Water supply and water treatment are complicated, often expensive, and the infrastructure required to deliver clean water to large populations um, often comes first to cities because of the cost and the logistical challenges. This isn't the case in high income countries, um, but for much of the world's population, clean or cleaner water can be a benefit of urbanization. There are drawbacks though. To go from a stream to a faucet requires this enormous infrastructure investment, and it usually requires water storage in places like reservoirs. In drought prone regions, this be can become a serious issue. The southwestern U.S., as an example, faces water scarcity in dry years in certain locations. And just a couple years ago, the city of Cape Town in South Africa came within literally a few days of actually running out of the municipal water supply due to an extended drought. Those types of vulnerabilities are likely to increase with climate change. There's one other point that is important to consider when it comes to urban settings and water, and that's that urban settings actually change regional hydrologic patterns. If you look at the image here, you can see a lot of asphalt and cement, and any water hitting the surface is going to run laterally rather than vertically into the soil. If you imagine these types of surfaces spread over tens of kilometers, then you can start thinking about how this would affect how water moves and flows and is stored across the region. If you have water running down and across parking lots and down streets, there is also the potential to increase water pollution because of all the contaminants that are often found in those settings. How do you address this? Well, there are a number of really interesting approaches to the management of hydrologic flows in urban settings that range from maintaining and supporting natural flow paths like small streams, to using more permeable materials and surface construction, um, the restoration of river pathways as we've seen in many cities in the United States is another option. And lastly, um, and something we'll talk about later in the course, the consideration of regional climate patterns and how they are changing becomes more and more important um, as cities confront how they provide water supply and how they address a warming climate um, in these densely populated areas where there's a lot of demand for consistent water supply. That's something we'll come back to later, but it's an important thing to flag now. To wrap up, we've seen that urbanization tends to increase energy availability in low and middle income countries. And it does lead to lower use of energy in some settings, particularly in comparison to suburban development in some higher income settings like the United States. Interestingly, with food supply, the trend toward urbanization also accelerates the trend toward industrial centralized agriculture with long or longer supply chains. For health and nutrition, urbanization has benefits in terms of access to food, but also drawbacks in terms of the potential spread of disease and, of course, persistent issues with food insecurity that are associated with economic inequality that is common in many urban settings. Lastly, urban water supplies can be a major improvement over less reliable rural supplies, especially in low-income settings. But there is also a long way to go to manage urban water in a way that preserves both the urban and the surrounding ecosystems and water access and safety um, in a changing climate. We'll cover those issues as we go forward.